Good morning, everyone. It's good to hear the voices out there and everyone uh, intermingling and, and chatting. It is, um, we want to welcome those ones who are watching online as well, and for those ones that may see this at a later point in time. Today is a special day. Today is Palm Sunday. And uh, it's uh, this, this from the point that uh, Palm Sunday to Resurrection Day, which is Easter Sunday, is, is called Passion Week or Holy Week. And uh, it's such a, I love to start reading my devotional, especially one that I have had for years. But it starts every day has to do with that walk up to the point of the crucifixion and then on into the resurrection. So it prepares, it prepares me for Easter. And uh, this is one of those days that uh, it's called the triumphant entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And um, th this is uh, in John 12, it talks about that. And uh, one of the verses uh, actually is uh, John 12 and verse 13 that I'm going to read. And that's actually a quote directly from Psalm 118 and verse 25. And this is what, uh, what they were shouting as Jesus was coming into Jerusalem. And um, they were saying, Hosanna. And that means, when it's transliterated in the Greek, it means save us, we pray. Save us, we pray. And they continued, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Wow, that sounds like you know, they had the palm branches. They were playing in the way in, in front. But you know the miraculous thing, hailing him as the Lord and as their king. But you know within a few days what they were shouting? Crucify him. Crucify him. And uh, the amazing thing is that uh, one day he is returning again. And in that day, it says that when he actually, when he comes to actually earth again, is that <clears throat> the thing that's going to happen that time is all will hail him as king. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Let's stand and sing this song that we're going to sing right now. It's all hail King Jesus. All hail Emmanuel. Sing it out. All hail King Jesus. All hail Emmanuel. King of kings, Lord of lords, bright morning star. And throughout eternity, I'll sing your praises, and I'll reign with you throughout eternity. All hail King Jesus, all hail Emmanuel, King of kings, Lord of lords, bright be a day, will it not? Reign with him through eternity. Continuing with, worthy, you are worthy. Lords, you are worthy. 
worship you. Holy, you are holy, King of kings, Lord of lords, you are holy. Holy, you are holy, King of kings, Lord of lords, I worship you. Jesus, you are Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, you are Jesus. Jesus, you are Jesus, King of kings, Lord of lords, I worship you. of kings, Lord of lords, I worship you. Amen. Good singing. You may be seated. I am so glad to see all of your smiling faces out here uh, and on online. I was reminded yesterday we had a memorial service for Shirley Christman, uh, Lucille Kirshner's sister, and um, uh, Several people said to me, we watch you every Sunday, and so hello to you out there. I'm glad there's at least two of you out there. Uh, the fan base is growing, okay, I got that. Yeah. And it's good to see Tom and Louise back from uh, uh, a long stay in California, and uh, their daughter Katie had an operation, and they were down there to um, help and encourage, and so it's good. And uh, and Mike and Karen, who uh, were, so, well, two of my favorites <laughs> from back in the 80s. They were such a part of the, the church here and then have been in all of our life. And so, so good to have you back, too. All right. Well, um, went to a movie. Uh, on Thursday night, and it was called The Ark in the Darkness. If you get a chance, you, you need to watch that. I, I, I think it's streaming, or you, you can, if you just plug it in, uh, there's, but we went uh, to a, a theater and, and watched it, and if you're not convinced that the flood was a real thing, that it was a worldwide thing, that the ark was specially built to house all of the kinds of animals, and that it wouldn't tip over in uh, uh, storms and and all of or in the big flood, uh, how how the rock layers got laid out in in the Grand Canyon and across the entire world. This it's it's a documentary form, but it is done very very well, and it it continue. It, it makes you more confident that the biblical story is right. And all other stories fall so far short of it. And so I encourage you to do it because, you know, when we're studying in the book of Genesis, Genesis really lays the groundwork for the rest of the Bible. And so if there's something in Genesis that isn't right, that isn't true, that negates the rest of the Bible. The Bible has to be true from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation chapter 22. It has to be true all the way through. There can't be one error. There can't be one mistake. There can't be one story thrown in just so it'll sound good. And so I would encourage you, if you can, to see that and to encourage others. And especially, especially, I know we have a lot of homeschool kids, but if they're in the public school system, you need to give them some ammunition to at least have them raise their hand and ask a question. Just, 
one of the things was laying of the rock layers. It was, it was so amazing because that happened with huge tsunamis that came across and it, it laid layers down evenly as opposed to any, any other slow process that might happen. And yet, at the end of it, you see rocks that are in S shapes. How do you put a rock in an S shape? Anytime I've ever tried to redesign a rock, it becomes pieces. But this is, this is shaped so beautifully. How did that happen? How did it happen? Teacher, can you tell me? And, and you don't have to be mean. You don't have to be, be obnoxious about it. You just need to ask questions. Maybe the teacher doesn't even realize that they're teaching something that is a fantasy. <coughs> so anyway, now to the Bible. All right. Well, uh, we were in the Bible. Um, this is, uh, turned out to be a two-part sermon, and there was a gasp from the audience and saying, I don't believe it, Dave. I don't know how you do that. But we're studying <coughs> the Joseph series, and it is let God be God. That's what Joseph had to do. He had, he had no choice, really, but sometimes when we don't have a choice, we still kind of fuss and, and uh, talk to God about how things are not fair and that kind of thing. He let God be God, and God took him through 13 years of, of tragedy, really, of being sold into slavery, going into the, uh, being accused of, uh, of rape, uh, being thrown into prison, being forgotten in prison, and then finally uh, released. But we learn from this, this story in Genesis chapter uh, 41 and verses 37 through 57. Last week we learned that God is sovereign. And you know what that means? God is in control. God has never lost control. Have you thought he has? Well, theologically, I know that he hasn't. Practically, many times I feel like... How can you let this happen? How is this happening? Why aren't, why aren't you coming? Because can the world get any more evil than it is right now? Yeah, apparently. But God is sovereign. God is in control of all things. And his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And we need to learn to trust those thoughts. And then God rewards those who are patiently <clears throat> waiting and he uh, empowered Joseph with both spiritual power and practical skills. And Joseph was rewarded with privilege and power and prestige. And that brings us to number three on your notes. Um, number three is God provides. God provides. When God is in control, he makes sure you have what you need to do what he's asking you to do. He's not going to call you to something that is above your pay grade, if you will. He will supply all the things that you need. And if you look at Joseph, where did he supply all the things that Joseph needed? As a slave. As a prisoner. That doesn't seem like a good training ground to me. But that's the way God, in his sovereign action, prepared Joseph for the greatest job that was available in the known world at the time. God provides. And in verses 46 <clears throat> um, and following, it says, And Joseph went throughout the land, I think getting to know the people and the country, because he had... He had been in the land, but he probably didn't get much traveling in. Now we're going to skip to the end of verse 46, and it says, And Joseph went out from Pharaoh's presence and traveled throughout the land. The one part that I left out of there was the phrase between these two verses, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh. I was very mature at 30. 
that was not funny. <laughs> you know, think about how mature you thought you were at 30. And how much more experience you needed to actually function in the world. I mean, not that we were inept at it or anything like that, that we didn't know anything. But at 30 years old, would you have been ready to run the United States? Well, based on current politicians, uh, probably. But would you have had that? Or in a company that you would, uh, you could be second in command of the CEO. You, you wouldn't have that kind of maturity and all of that. And yet, here is Joseph at 30 years old being handed the keys to the Egyptian kingdom. It's an empire. It is the major empire in the world. And Pharaoh basically is saying, don't talk to me about anything. Talk to Joseph. I'm still the king. I'm still in command. But you need to focus and talk to Joseph. 30 years old. And when you look at it, and he's traveling, would he be able to govern the world empire? Would people respect him? Would he have the knowledge? And here's the key. Would he have the ability to handle the power? So many of us can handle adversity much better than we can prosperity. <laughs> Could he handle the position? Would it go to his head? Would he buy a yacht for the Nile? What, 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 what would he do with all this vast power? And we're going to see that God has prepared him and God has provided the things that he is going to need to run this vast empire. Letter A, God provides the preparation for the task. God prepares the preparation for the task. Because... You, you look at Joseph's life up until this time, he is a proven survivor. He has made it through some really tough years, 13 of them to be exact. From being in his father's favorite child with, with a beautiful robe that he, and, and had the authority to be able to go to be sold into slavery in 13 years of being off the grid, if you will. He suffered rejection. He suffered shame, sexual temptation, prison. But he emerged, like it says in 1 Peter 1, 7, he emerged as gold refined by the fire. Many of us have the gold bands from our marriages or we have other gold items. And you know, for that gold to be pure and good, it has to go through the fire. You, you can't make it beautiful without the fire. And God takes that same principle and he puts it on us and he says, you can't be pure, you can't be usable unless you've gone through the fire. Now, the fire for us is, is different for each person. Some have gone through very difficult tragedies. Some sicknesses, some diseases, some personal relationships that have, have not gone right. But that's, that's fire. And God puts us through the fire for a reason. And we never go through anything that isn't for a reason. And as we look at Joseph's life as he has gone through the prison and, and the slavery and all of that, we're going to see that that was all preparation for what God wanted him to do ultimately in leading the nation of Egypt. He emerged like gold through severe testing. He showed what his strong point really was. And it gave him courage to face obstacles I mean, what more could you do to a guy? 
And when they, you know, when he was in prison, they said they had shackles on his feet and around his neck. I don't think he was going to run any place, but they put them on him anyway. He had courage to face the obstacles. He had confidence to carry out his duties. He worked in Potiphar's house. He ran a whole huge household, not just a, a little two-bedroom place. This, was, this guy was really influential. He ran his uh, pastures and his flocks and, and all the household. Then he gets thrown into prison, and what does he end up running there? He ends up being second in command in the prison and running the prison, and prisons don't have really nice people in them. He learned to deal with adversity, and he did it and learned out how to carry it out with confidence. And best of all, I think he learned the right attitude. What attitude would you have if you got falsely accused and thrown into prison? You might be bitter. You might be unhappy. You might be blaming God. But apparently, that was not Joseph. He saw that God was God, and he was allowing him to be that. God was with Joseph all through all of this. In, in fact, in chapter 50 of Genesis and verse 20, it says, when he's talking to his brothers, he says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You might not have the best motives for what you do to me or to someone else, but Joseph saw that God was in control. You meant it. You meant it to harm me. In fact, you were hoping I'd never come back into your lives. And yet God meant it for good. And not only for the saving of Egypt and, and piling up all the f food in the seven good years, but he, it was for the nation of Israel. It was, it was for this little group of about 70 people still in Canaan that were going to starve to death if something wasn't done about the seven years of famine that were coming up. God had it all planned out, and he needed Joseph where he was at the time that he was there in order not only to save many in the world, but to save that which he started in Genesis chapter 12 when he called Abraham. And he says, I will make of you a great nation. Well, what's going to happen if they all die in a famine? Oh, God is working. God is on his level working, and he's bringing it all to the place where the only way this would work out was Joseph being where he was. Wow. And don't you feel bad after you, you see how God worked something out in your life and you weren't very cooperative with it? And then you go, ah, that's why I have a flat forehead. I've said it often. So as we, as we look with, at, at Jake, uh, Joseph, we, we see that he teaches us to be aware of the providence of God in our lives. God is, God is working whether you know it or not. In fact, I, I, I want to invite you to uh, uh, our first uh, Sunday evening service of, uh, of the year. We're going to do a four-part um, uh, talk on the providence of God, of how, how that all works, so that we can see with confidence that our God is working whether we think so or not. Um, I forget when it starts. What, April what, uh, Chris? Okay. April 7th and then the next four weeks. And, and, we're, and for those of you that uh, will come and put up with me preaching, we are going to have desserts afterwards. Okay? All right. All oh, right. I've talked to a few people, and, and I thought they came be, to hear me uh, when I talked on the parables, um, and it turned out that they came for the ice cream. So, 
Anyway, I'll, I'll get over it. Therapy helps. But, so, he, he, we need to be aware of the providence of God, and we, meet, we need to be convinced of God's role for us in, in this life. He, do, do you realize he has a purpose for your life? He, and he wants you to find it? And it's not just sitting here on a Sunday morning listening to me. It, it's getting involved. It's, it's service. It's, it's being a part of the body. He has something for you, and you're sitting out there saying, well, I've checked my inventory, and there's not much I have to offer. But God didn't put you into the body without something to offer. And you know how to best find the place for you to work? Is get involved in something. I found out early that the nursery was not my gift. So God directed me to college kids, and, and that wasn't much better, but at least I didn't have to change diapers. Uh, well, maybe. So get involved. But there is a purpose for our testing. And the purpose many times is to mature us both spiritually and emotionally and physically. It is, it is to bring us to a place where we are complete. And we don't do it unless we are forced by many times testing to have that happen. We gain valuable experience. We, we begin to see the, the uh, sustaining grace of God as we go through things we th we, that we didn't think we were going to be able to go through. God sustains us. We learn to wait on the Lord. And oh, that's a bad word, right? Wait. I'm very patient. Just ask him, anybody that knows me. No, we're not patient, are we? We pray to God, give me patience, and I want it now. Yeah, yeah. But we need to, like J Joseph, 13 years, he had to learn to wait on the Lord and trust God that he was still in control. And we need to know without a doubt that he is at work. How do we know that in Joseph's life? We got to read ahead. Joseph didn't have the have the privilege of having the written word at his disposal to say, okay, God, this is going to work out in another two years. I will be second in command of Egypt. He didn't have that. But he had a confidence that God was working no matter whether he knew it or not. And we need to learn to develop perseverance. I... I had a boss one time that says, perseverance means stick with the stuff. Just stick with it. Hang in there. And so while we're waiting, remember God has not forget, forgotten us. He sees everything, in, and we need to see everything in the light of God's preparation for us and whatever we're going through. Letter B, God provides a plan Verses 47 to 57. And that plan during, during the seven years of abundance the land produced plentifully or abundantly I guess. Joseph collected all the food produced in those seven years of abundance in Egypt and stored them in the cities. In each city, he put the food grown in the fields surrounding it. Joseph stored up huge quantities of grain, like the sand of the sea. It was so much that he stopped keeping records because it was beyond measure. Now skip down to verse 53. We'll come back to these verses in a minute. The seven years of abundance in Egypt came to an end. Isn't that what he predicted in the interpretation of the dream? Seven years of abundance, and then it came to an end, and now the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph has said. There was famine in all the other lands, but in the whole land of Egypt there was food. And when all of Egypt felt the famine, the people tried 
um, cried to Pharaoh for food, and then Pharaoh told the Egyptians, go to Joseph and do what he says. So when we see this, Joseph had a plan, and he laid it out for, for Pharaoh, and Pharaoh um, accepted it. But now you can, you can put any plan you want out there. But what's the proof? That it works. That it actually works. And so here is, here's Joseph. He is now in charge. And will it work? Well, for seven years, the land produced plentifully bumper crops, one after the other. And I think God made the seven years of abundance really clear that it wasn't normal. Why would God do that? God would do, does it to show that it was him. This, this is not natural. This seven years of abundance is, is supernatural. They're still growing things. They're still doing all the things that they should do. But the harvest comes in and it just it, it blows everybody away. He's keeping meticulous records until, oh man, what, I can't keep track. God is in control. And, and the Apostle Paul even said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay... This treasure is the light of Jesus Christ in these feeble vessels in order that the excellence of the power is shown to be from God and not from us. The most amazing things done for God are, are through people that you would not think it's going to happen through. God chooses but he wants the glory to go to him. And this is what is happening here. The excellence of the power is from God and not from us. Now, do you think that everybody in Egypt thought that Joseph was a genius? <sighs> Hardly. It's, it's like when when a new person comes into a company or something and, and all of a sudden they've got the, all these great new ideas and the, the CEO is sold on it and says, you go for it. And, the, and everybody goes right along with it. No. But Joseph began to prove himself. He began to show that all this training that had been going on in Potiphar's house and in the prison and in the waiting, all of these things were, were working together so that he could face that kind of criticism. People were probably saying, ha, ah, young whippersnapper. That's, do you guys know what whippersnapper means? No? No, I didn't think so. It's Greek. <laughs> and I am well versed in Greek, I'll tell you. All right. But they would say, he's on a power trip. Who says there's going to be a famine after all of this abundance? And they're probably saying, it won't last. We've been through these things before. We've had ups and we've had downs. But he kept on going. And the famine was in all the lands, it says, after the abundance. And finally, they began to see it. But even then, they're probably looking at it and saying, oh, it's only one year. We got lots of food over here. You know what's amazing to me is that Joseph is piling up all this grain. He, he got 20% of all, all the grain, right? For the king, for, the, for Pharaoh. Wouldn't you think there would be some people that would say, maybe we ought to be storing up some of this extra. But do you know people in Egypt were probably not much different than us? What happens when we get extra? Hey, the tax return just came. Let's go buy a boat. To me, it would be one that would sail in a bathtub. But why wouldn't people pick up on this? 
you, we're going to see in the next chapter that people in Egypt are coming and begging for food. They've already run out. They, they've spent the excess. Amazing. So he says, go to Joseph. When all Egypt began to feel the famine, the people cried to Pharaoh for food. And then Pharaoh told all the Egyptians, go to jo Joseph and listen to what he said. Do what he tells you. And I think Nike read this portion. Just do it. Uh, I, probably not. Okay. Letter C. God has removed, uh, and I think this, uh, I left this word out of your notes. God has removed the sting of the past. So if you want to add that. Chris does a real good job on all my notes, but he is not a mind reader. He cannot fill in what I don't put in there. So, But in verses 50 to 52, we see a kind of an interlude. During the time of, of the abundance, God grants Joseph another affirmation that he is the man that he wants him to be. And he gives him two sons. One is Manasseh. And he names him Manasseh because it is because God has made me forget all my troubles and all my father's household. Man, that's a, that's a lot of forgetting. His own brother sold him into slavery. Forget all of my troubles. Thirteen years of troubles and, and yet he names his first son Manasseh. Joseph's key to survival really is his attitude, which is all by the grace of God. And some of us have not learned to get over the past. The past is, has things in it that we, we think we cannot overcome. They haunt us. But we live so much in the past, we forget that there is a present. There is a future. And we don't take advantage of the time that God is giving us right now because we're haunted by something in the past. And Joseph could have been that person. He could have been scuffing his feet and walking around and saying, yeah, I was in this prison and I was this and I was that. He didn't do that. We, we need to be able to see that there is forgiveness there's peace, there's joy, there's family, there's friends. We need, we need to live in the present and enjoy it. And we also need to live towards the future. The ministry that God has given us and going to give us and wor work through us on. And we always are looking forward to heaven. When we are so consumed with the past, we forget what God has laid out for us as our eternal reward. It was so beautiful yesterday to talk about Shirley Chrisman because her life was lived for the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I love to do memorials for people who have lived for Jesus. When I don't have to kind of hem and haw around how they live their life, or talk in a way that people in the audience are saying, I don't recognize that person. Am I in the wrong funeral? And you've seen it. You've been in those. But to be able to see somebody that allowed the past to be forgiven, covered by the blood of Jesus Christ, the present opens up and our future is bright. Our salvation comes and Paul says we are new creatures therefore if anyone is in Christ he is a new cre creation the new has come and the old is gone well the old doesn't really go all that away but the new can overcome it and then he has another son named Ephraim 
You'll notice these are listed uh, when we start to look at the tribes of Israel. Um, they are the sons of Joseph, and so instead of the uh, tribe of Joseph, it's Ephraim and Manasseh are, are the two. And they're still a representative. And he says this in verse 52, For God has caused me to be fruitful in the, in the land of my affliction. He has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. He's not talking about psychotherapy. He's not talking about trying to uh, just get right with the world. He is talking about God who has taken this affliction that he's gone through and he is giving him fruitful ministry. By the grace of God, we, we can turn sorrow into joy. That's Manasseh. And we can turn barrenness into fruitfulness. And that's Ephraim. But you know, it really comes down to our choice of whether we're going to believe God or not. He's not just going to dump it on, it on us. He is going to ask us to look and believe in who he is. And that we would live a life that leaves a legacy that would count for eternity. By God's grace, we can turn away from the past, face the brightness of God's future. It's in, that future is in Christ. Make your life count for God. Number four, what can we learn from Joseph's story? Well, hopefully we've learned a few things already, but we're going to learn a few more. Letter A, we can endure trials by God's grace. Have you ever said, I can't get through this? This is too much. I, I can't believe what's happening. That diagnosis that the doctor just gave or uh, what I came home and, and there was a notice on the door, you no longer live here. Uh, divorce and other things have come into people's lives and we say, I don't think I can go on. When Claudia passed away, the one thing I thought, how, how am I, after 58 years of marriage, going to go on without her? But if you get trapped in that, if you see that you can't, you, you just say to God, I can't get through this, who are you dependent on? You are depending on yourself. Our eyes need to be fixed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and he gives us the grace to endure the trials. Joseph may have been a slave in Egypt, but he was not a slave to self-pity. He may have been a prisoner, but not a prisoner of doubt and discouragement. Joseph kept his eyes on the Lord. Let her be. We can be free from bad memories. We, we're not able to erase bad memories. <laughs> they, they never really go away. But we don't have to be slaves to them. And because Paul says this in Romans 6.16, 6, don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are a slave of the one you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. Don't you know that? Which one are you giving yourself to as a slave? Hmm? Are you? Okay. Philippians, that was Andrew. He, he always comments on my sermons, and so I know I made a good point when Andrew says something. Philippians 4.8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. And what happens when we get in the pit? When the things go wrong? We don't think those thoughts. 
But that's what God wants us to focus on. We can be free from the burden of past memory, bad memories. Letter C, don't let the past hold you back. Joseph could have missed out on great opportunity had he had the wrong attitude. And many of us need fail to use our lives uh, and live them productive, productively because God, because something in the past happens or harmed us. And when those words come, it is really the work of Satan talking and not that of God. Letter D. Let, the pa let past experiences prepare you to persevere. Stick with the stuff. Hebrews 10.36 says, Patient endurance or perseverance is what you need now so that you will continue to do God's will. It is hard to keep doing God's will when it doesn't seem like it's working. When you are being kind to someone and they are not being kind back to you. When you are trying to serve in a particular area and it's just not working out, God says to you, stick with it. Continue to do God's will. Hebrews 11.27 says, By faith he, this is Moses, left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. He saw the God of the Bible. He saw the power of that God, the sovereignty of that God, the mercy of that God, that love of that God. He saw it without actually seeing God. And it caused him to persevere. And oh, did he have to persevere as he led the nation of Israel. 2 Thessalonians 1.4 says, Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all, listen to this, in all your persecutions and trials that you are enduring. They were sticking to it even though it was costing them. James 1 verses 2 to 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you think, oh, I think it's no, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, and let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. Don't give up. Keep after it. God is right. The Bible is right. The way that he has laid out for us is right. And sometimes we get about halfway through and we want to deviate. We want to doubt. 2 Peter 1, 5 through 7 says, For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. See, Joseph is telling us, Keep your eyes on the sovereign God who in his providence is making all things come out for your good and for his glory. Do you believe it? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you continue to work in and through us. We thank you that you are a God who perseveres with us. And we pray that we would be like Joseph, that we would see that life's preparation, the things that we have gone through in our lives, have molded us and shaped us so that you can use us even now. And Father, my prayer for me has been, I want to finish well. And I pray that same prayer for all who are here and who are listening online that we might all finish well because of all the preparation that you have made in our lives. 
to be effective and useful in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen? Amen. Amen. To finish well, that's quite the statement. And um, it is something that uh, we wonder when, uh, when our time has passed and those that are left behind, what they're going to be searching or looking through the things that we've done or kept or whatever and what those responses will be, the memories that they will have. And um, as I was listening to, to Pastor Dave, I was thinking that uh, Joseph had interpreted the dream. He gave a plan. And I was thinking those first seven years, I imagine there's people marking the calendar. Month one, month two, year one, year... Because they were thinking, this guy... I mean, I can only imagine what the news would be reporting today. We've got a guy that's in prison that's now second in command. Can you imagine? But they were waiting for that after seven years, what was going to happen. Can you imagine the fact? I think it happened at seven years, there was a famine. Just like the Bible says. Those people couldn't believe the fact that Joseph was that right. And it did show. It gave God the glory. And I'm sure Joseph did that. We're going to continue with our, our thought process, though, of grace. I, I heard you say grace several times, Pastor. And I remember a definition. I don't know if it's you that gave it years ago. But a definition of grace is one of the definition, definitions is the power and desire to do that which we ought. Was that you? <laughs> yeah, but that is a different definition than you usually hear. But, but think of that with Joseph. That's what it was. God gave him the grace, and he, he believed in his God such a way that he did that which was right, in, which, in, in, in the fact of the power he knew would come from his God. We're going to sing a song that is more looking at the fact of this week. As we look at the cross, as we look at our, our Lord who gives that grace, <laughs> and even when he was heading for the cross, when you look at the attitude, when you look at his desire and what he said of his love for us, this song is How Deep the Father's Love. Stand with us, please. Uh, How Deep the Father's Love for Us. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only Son and make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory behold the man upon the cross my sin upon his shoulders a shame Why should I 
came from his reward. I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Why should I keep from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. And continuing with Calvary Covers It All. Far dearer than all that the world can impart was the message that came to my heart. How the Jesus of sin did atone and Calvary covers it all Calvary covers it all my past with its sin and stain my guilt and despair Jesus took on him the grace when I look in the face of this Jesus my crucified Lord my redemption complete I then found at his feet and Calvary covers it all Calvary covers it all singing and then on to the next one rejoice the Lord is King sing it out (laughs) 
Rejoice, the Lord is King, your Lord and King adore. Rejoice, give thanks and sing, and triumph evermore. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. Jesus, the Savior, reigns, the God of truth and love. When he had purged our stains, he took his seat above. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. kingdom cannot fail he rules o'er earth and hell the keys of death and hell are to our jesus give lift up your heart lift up your voice rejoice again i say Rejoice in glorious hope, Jesus the judge shall come and take his servants up to their eternal home. Lift up your heart, lift up your voice, rejoice again, I say. Great singing. You may be seated. We're going to have um, the youth choir sing at this time, and we're looking forward to that.
This will go to the Lord for prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Because of your great love, we are not consumed. For your compassions never fail. They're new every morning. Great your faithfulness. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one that who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Lord, during the time of your triumphal entry into Jerusalem, people were shouting Hosanna as they were expecting a king that will come to save and deliver. But soon after, the echoes of Hosanna faded and was replaced with shouts of crucify him. Lord, as we ponder, as we contemplate on this Palm Sunday and reflecting on the, on the events that were to take place, it seems that what you have asked Martha that you're asking us today, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will never die. And whoever lives by believing me will live. Do you believe this? Do I believe this? But we ask that you strengthen us and give us faith in you to know that the Christ dwells in our hearts through faith. And so that we may grasp how wide and long and high and deep the love of Christ is. Lord, we also ask that you increase our fear in you. So now we will not, we will not show contempt of the riches of your kindness, of your forbearing and patience, and not realizing that your kindness is intended to lead us to repentance. But we ask that you guard the feet of your faithful saints, and the wicked will be kept in the place, in silence, in the place of darkness. For all the, in, in, spite, in spite of the difficulties and, and, uh, and the problems, due to our, the reluctance that, we, that you have left in our lives, which is asked that you make us not to hear, but to see that your grace is sufficient for us, that your power is, is, is made perfect in our weakness. Lord, we ask that you watch over our, watch over our lives and watch our going and coming, both now and forevermore. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Well, first I want to thank our youth choir. Uh, your performance was beautiful, and your choice of songs brought a tear to my eyes. Well, today is Palm Sunday, as we've mentioned before, and it's something that you can find in all four of the Gospels. And if you uh, picked up a bulletin as you came in, I, I suspect that on the front there's a Bible verse you can find there, that, that if you go to that Bible verse this week in your reading and uh, read from there, you'll remember what uh, Palm Sunday is all about, and you'll remember what uh, Jesus did during the Passion Week and uh, the events of that week. So any one of the Gospels will take you there. And uh, also, if you uh, want to do some further reading, you can uh, go back to Zechariah chapter 9, where 500 years before the events happened, that prophet said, here's what's going to happen. And he did that because God told him to say that. So, okay, well, we have a business meeting coming up after this meeting. So uh, after we finish the final uh, music, uh, James will look at the clock and say, come back in, and he'll tell you when that time is, so you can have a few minutes to Get, catch your breath and uh, drink some water, and et cetera. And uh, what we uh, usually take less than an hour. We only do it once a year. And we'll give you a little update on what happened last year and what our plans are for this next year. So please stay if you're interested. And uh, that's when we reelect uh, elders and deacons and uh, approve the budget too. So it's important to do it, but uh, uh, we try to make it fast and interesting. All righty. Well, in the, the following week, next Sunday, 
is Easter, of course, and so we'll take a little vacation for, uh, from Genesis for that. And we have a special uh, message that Pastor Dave's prepared, and you'll want to come for that. And then uh, we'll come back to Genesis the next week, and the next week is uh, April 7th. Uh, the math was right. So that evening, you can come here, and we'll start the Providence uh, series at uh, 6 o'clock. So that, that's a, uh, a slightly abbreviated service, but we have a teaching from the, uh, on the subject of Providence. I think Pastor Dave said he had 61 different lessons he could do, but he picked uh, four of the best. So uh, we will uh, sing some songs, and you'll have an opportunity to pick songs t for the following week. So we'll talk about that next week. So wait, how do you do that? And then uh, we do have dessert afterwards. So hope, hope you join us for that. And let's see, what's up? Oh, you remember not that long ago we had a nurse from CareNet come and tell us about what's going on in their ministry and all the good things that uh, they're doing to uh, help young families uh, in this uh, King County and Pierce County area, and uh, especially to help uh, babies who are uh, on the way complete their mission and uh, come to uh, take their first breath. And uh, um, one of the things they have, actually I think they have a couple of them, but one of them is they have a mobile clinic that uh, drives around to areas where they don't have a uh, brick and mortar location, and uh, th there you can, uh, uh, if, you're, if you're a woman, <laughs> you can get an ultrasound and see if uh, you, in fact, are uh, pregnant and what your baby looks like. And if you remember from prior reports, over 90% of the women who, in its upper 90s, women who choose to uh, get that ultrasound with them deliver the baby. So we are excited about that. But you may remember that one of their mobile clinics was totaled in an, a vehicle accident and uh, they had to go out and find a new one. And just this last week, the new one was uh, launched and it's uh, traveling around. And uh, if you uh, look uh, in the bulletin boards, when you take our little break here after between the service and the meeting, you'll see pictures of it. And the uh, people who uh, drive the van and who uh, do the work in the back of the van, or maybe it's an RV, but anyway, they, uh, they have some prayer requests for us, so you can look at those. So anyway, they're, they're out there, and they are doing their best, and one of their prayers is that they would uh, find good locations where they could serve near the new abortion clinic in Renton. So let's uh, be praying for them. Okay, uh, while you're between the two uh, meetings, you can... Stay and look on the screen. You'll get to see the sermon notes up there, uh, and you can fill in any blanks that you missed in your notes. And you'll also see the uh, gospel message and how to come to Jesus through prayer if you haven't already done that, too. Okay, well, we're going to have an abbreviated one year Bible uh, this week. We had a, the long director's cut last week. But uh, just to bring you up to the basics of the one year Bible program. A one-year Bible is, is the complete Bible with the readings uh, resorted so that uh, every day you can read for 15 or 20 minutes and be reading something. And in 365 days, they don't have, have a leap year section, but in 365 days, you will complete the reading of the whole Bible. And we give those away. And we just had a new delivery this week, so there's plenty. If you haven't started, uh, we're just not quite a quarter of the way into the year, so it's a great time to be starting it. Books are on the front table, and you can get one of those. And then, yep, there it is, good, perfect. Uh, we have on our website more information about the program and information about different ways that you can do it. If you're, if you're not one of the people who likes to read in a paper book, there's audio editions you can get. Uh, through their website. You can get online editions and there's study aids that come with all those. So uh, visit our website. The uh, URL address is up there on the screen and uh, it'll get you to it really easily. Okay, well I think I see our uh, uh, ushers there. They're ready. So let's go to the Lord again in prayer and then they will receive the offering that you've brought today. Dear Lord, you are so good. We remember the honor that was given to you that one morning of the Palm Sunday, and then we remember what you did for us after that, what you went through, and your triumph as you 
rose from the grave, did final instructions to your disciples, and then went to sit at your Father's right hand until the time when you will come for us. Lord, we just thank you that uh, you are so good that you provide us the breath, the, the land on which we stand, the food we eat, the jobs, the people we love. All these things are from your providence. And Lord, we just thank you for them. Thank you for this chance to serve in this ministry, in our acts, with our treasure, and with our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. great service today. I enjoyed, uh, I, I was listening to the youth choir there, and uh, I actually knew what that song was going to be before they sang it, and I listened to it multiple times this week. And um, it's not an easy song to sing. It's not at all. And I appreciate them leading them and, and growing them to sing those difficult songs. And uh, that is great. And it, and it sounded great. I um, want to sing, I uh, just close with a song, and um, just uh, scripture as we sing this is just the fact that, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And someone had said, the only way we can love him is because he first loved us, and we see that in First John 4, 19, of course. But uh, watch the words uh, as the uh, gentleman that wrote this, his name was Avis M. Christensen, and uh, he talks, I think, a lot about our, our grace of our God and our Father. So let's stand and sing, Blessed Redeemer. Up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn. Ah, Christ my Savior, weary and worn, facing for sinners, death on the cross, that he might save them from endless loss. 
Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. Life blood flowed fast away, praying for sinners while in such woe. No one but Jesus ever loved so. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see. Sure, my tongue shall praise him forevermore. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree, wounded and bleeding for sinners. This week you'll remember that song and kind of hum that one and remember the words.